In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On this sun, first Sunday after the Epiphany, the, um, we celebrate and commemorate and remember the baptism of Jesus. And so in our thanksgiving for baptism, joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us now give thanks for the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea, you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, your Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains life. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit and renew our lives with your forgiveness, your grace and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord in the unity of the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen.
Christ forever, Lamb of God and Lord of love, Son of God and gracious Savior, you have come from heaven above. On the cross you died to save us, now you reign at God's right hand. Hear our prayer, restore, forgive us, in your promise firm we stand. Lord, alone to you we call. Holy One, in faith we name you, God most high yet near to all. Jesus Christ, with God the Spirit, in the Father's splendor bright. For the peace that we inherit, glory be to God on We're now invited to sing along while muted at home as we sing the gathering song. Arise, your light has come. The Spirit all obey, show forth the glory of your God, which shines on you today. Arise, your light has come, fling wide the prison door. Proclaim the captive's liberty, good tidings to the poor. Arise, your light has come, all you in sorrow born. and comfort those who mourn. Arise, your light has come, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's power will make us strong. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with all of you, and also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, creator of light and giver of goodness, your voice moves over the waters. Immerse us in your grace and transform us by your spirit that we may follow after your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Genesis, the first chapter. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, 
The earth was a formless void and darkness, darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judea countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Every year we celebrate this, the baptism of our Lord Jesus. Um, it's amazing, you know, baptism is more, is, a, is in our term is more of a ritual. Um, as when I was an active pastor, I remember many times uh, young people coming to me and, and saying, we need to get our child baptized, and, but we're not active in the church. One of the first thing I'd ask them is, is this to satisfy grandma? Um, and then we would talk a little bit, of, and most of the time the answer was yes. And then we'd talk a little bit, be open and fair about, about faith and what it means and about baptism and what it means. And I think sometimes because we, we think of baptism as a ritual, we forget the power that baptism has. It's hinted to in the lesson this morning where it says that when Jesus was baptized, the heavens were torn apart. Um, the writer Luke or Mark does not want to suggest that this was just a soft little voice that came out of heaven. This, this was a thunderous voice. And it said, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. Um, we know in baptism then, according to the story of Mark and, and the other gospels, that Jesus is going to be the person that God says he's going to be. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. You know, in our language, and, and it gives Jesus his identity. That's part of the, what the story is all about and part of the story of baptism. Jesus receives his identity there. It's all done before he begins his ministry. You know, identity is an important thing for all of us. Um, a long time ago, it occurred to me that our language, um, according to a study, according to a, a discipline called linguistic analysis, it says that language really carries with it, in, with, and under the words we speak, it carries with it our cultural values. And here's one that occurred to me years ago that's really interesting. And I don't know if other people have written about it. I don't know where I got the idea. But one time, many, many years ago, it occurred to me that we meet somebody and we talk to them and we give our names. And then what comes up is the question, what do you do? 
And it's interesting how the answer doesn't really answer the question. We answer the question by saying, well, I am a minister or I am an engineer or I am a teacher or I am a restaurant server um, or I, I am, and then you fill in the blank. What's interesting about this is in the English language, when you use the word am, it, it refers to a mathematical equation. If A is B, then A equals B. Am is an equal sign. So what we're really saying is I am or I equal a minister. That's my being. That's my identity. In fact, um, if we remember algebra, I notice I, I've been kind of looking at Facebook every once in a while and I notice one of my relatives put up, um, what's the worst book you ever read? And the answer came up, Algebra 1. Yeah, I remember those days in ninth grade. But what I learned was is that a mathematical equation is known as an identity. What exists on one side of the equal sign has to be the same thing as the other side. You can say it differently, like two equals one plus one. And you can say it many different ways, but eventually it's got to be exactly the same. Think about that when we say, I am a teacher, or even I was a teacher. Um, that gives our identity. The problem is, what happens if you take away one side of the equation? The answer becomes zero. So for many, for example, um, when it comes time to retirement, some will say, you know, I don't want to retire because I don't have any identity if I retire. And many people have trouble with retiring because you've taken away one side of the identity. And, I, and what it says is I no longer have an identity. More than that, it says I no longer have any worth because my identity also is tied up with my worth and meaning in life and purpose. And so in our culture, our language carries with it this equation of what our identity is all about. Many years ago, after a funeral, I met uh, the, uh, the member of the, that I held the funeral, officiated at his funeral. His daughter and, and son-in-law had come in from Denver and uh, we were sitting in, in the backyard um, of the house um, and we got talking and I, and, and I know that the person, the, the um, person that I buried had told me that her son-in-law was the CFO of a large energy company. And so I said to him, Jack, I said, you were CFO of Williams Energy, weren't you? And uh, I'm gonna hold the answer until later in the sermon. But there was the, there was the question, you were, because he was retired, you were the CFO. So what I was saying was, you and all of your meaning in life and all of your identity is equal to you being a CFO. You know, society gives us that. That's part of our culture. It gives us our identity, our meaning, our values in life and our value in life as a citizen or as a person. We can see how powerful this is of having society define for us who we are, of telling us that we must, if we are a teacher or whatever, that when we stop, we're zero, we have no more value. Um, all we need to do is look at teenagers today in social media, many, many teens, and it's extremely strong influence, get their value as human beings. They're now in their teen years, you know, we're all searching for identity and, and trying to figure ourselves because we're beginning to break away from the identity we get from our parents and we're trying to find that separate identity in life and our meaning and our worth and our pathway. Um, I'm sure we all remember as teens, it's, and looking back, it's, it's a tough, tough time. There is a lot going on. And now we've got social media that has immediate answers and can destroy young human beings, not to mention sometimes adults, but 
young human beings have been known to commit suicide because the world around them in their social media world tells them they have no worth or no value. There's body shame. We do it through power. There's body shaming. There's um, uh, racism online. There's uh, all kinds of all kinds of prejudice dealing with sexual orientation. All of those things are extremely powerful when we get our identity from the world, which we tend to do. We can also use that equation, I am or you are. Um, we can also use that to define others um, through fear, false narratives, conspiracy theories, in order to elevate our own self-worth. The problem with our identity is that sometimes we don't need the world to give us our identity because we already feel that we don't have any, that we don't have any worth, that we are I am equals a zero, that I have no purpose, no meaning. And then we're open for all kinds of things. Then, then our identity becomes a commodity, um, something to, to let the world tell us that we're okay. Sometimes, for example, we can be so depleted of self-esteem that we need constantly need the world to tell us we're wonderful. And then we can become narcissists. Um, totally low self-esteem and need of the world to tell us how, how we have value and worth before others. And then it can be used by society, identity, telling people they are worthless telling people they have no value in the process, building ourselves up. And you can end up with societies where there is systemic prejudice. Um, obviously the one that comes to mind is Nazi Germany. That's the standard bearer. Um, that's the, the most extreme example. There are other countries, but this was the most extreme example where there are, uh, where international Jew Jewish conspiracy theories um, set out and where a society set out to destroy an entire race of people. Um, we also, in our society, have prejudices. And one of the things we can, we use in society is stereotyping. Um, instead of looking at individuals and people as individuals, we can take an entire group of people and our society can tell them they have no worth. Um, and that can change over time. Um, for example, one of the redresses that the United States had against England or the colonies had against England in the opening paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence, we clamored for immigration, send us immigrants. And of course, over time, immigrants have been acceptable. Over time, some of them have been unacceptable. Um, Irish or Catholic or whatever uh, throughout our history. We have a powerful response to identity of groups of people and that can elevate white supremacy or the supremacy of the natives who live here. I mean native whites who said they were nativists. So there's a whole thing that's built up in this um, this thing about identity and in our and it's carried through our language, um, and it's can be dangerous. In the story today, Jesus is baptized, and we're told that the way they describes the the way that that Mark describes the baptism is by using the language of of a violent tearing open of heaven. This is a momentous occasion in the history of humanity. And in the baptism comes the voice of God that says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And there's the affirmation or the conference of God, the creator, creating an identity for God's son. Um, and that changes by the way the equation. No longer is the identity I equal something. Now identity is conferred by God. And it really 
usurps any identity that the world will give Jesus. In fact, one way to look at the gospel struggle of Jesus is to discover that Jesus was constantly struggling to hold on to the identity that God gave Jesus and society and the powers of the world didn't want Jesus to have that identity. So they tried to equate Jesus with the devil. Um, he has Beelzebub. They tried to, to equate Jesus with a blasphemer. Well, he claims he's, he's got his identity comes from God, but he's really defiling all of that. It, it changes the whole, whole idea of baptism, I mean, of identity, this idea of baptism. But this is precisely in the gospel lesson. The good news for you and me is that this too is where our, our identity comes from. It comes from our baptisms. And it changes the equation. The power of baptism that me and many others, and I'm sure all of us, have taken for granted and have forgotten about is that God also in baptism makes us Jesus's brothers and sister. Earlier in our liturgy today, we talked about baptism and in, in our thanksgiving for baptism and how it makes us the brothers and sisters of Jesus. And added to the first lesson about creation in Genesis is that in baptism, and Paul tells us this, we are recreated. And now our identity does not come from the world, it cannot be conferred by people who hate us or it cannot be conferred by others, but it gives us the power of, of baptism that our, our value and worth comes from God. Think about that a minute. How many times in your life have you felt worthless? I know I have. I will share with you, I had a really rough time in college um, and during the Vietnam War and the civil rights movement. And, um, I used to have on my mirror a poem, English poem by the English poet Matthew Arnold from the uh, Victorian period. And there is a part called Dover Beach and there's a part of it says, let us be love, let us be true, O love, because the world which stands before us has really um, love nor certitude nor help from pain. It's a, it's a very dark poem and um, I don't have that anymore because I rediscovered that my worth doesn't come from my sense of lostness or my search for identity. I'm already identified by God. This is my child with whom I am well pleased. Think about that in your own life, how powerful that could be to rely on the power of baptism. That's why in one congregation I served, I used to, I, I wanted to find a way to visit people and I used to visit them on the anniversary of somebody in the household's baptism. And we would do a Thanksgiving for baptism. It has such power because it allows us to take our power back. The world cannot define us. We cannot be defined by our successes in life. Look how wonderful I am or our failures in life. Um, look how terrible I am. I used to suffer from that problem. Um, I one time worked for a life insurance company. I sold, I won everything that that company had to offer in incentives and gifts, except the top prize. And at the time I considered my entire career there a big failure because I was a perfectionist. I wanted the top prize and anything less than that meant that I didn't have any worth. Um, looking back now, that seems rather silly. But nevertheless, if we could go through our life, we can impart to young people that the power of baptism is real. I want to go back to my friend, Jack. We're sitting in the evening, drinking a glass of wine after the funeral. And I said to him, Jack, you were the CFO of Williams Energy, weren't you? And here came his answer. John, that's what I did. That's not who I am. And that struck me between the, between the eyes, that he could differentiate that, yes, he was a CFO, but that's not who he was. That did not define his value and worth as a human being, that he was a person. And we talked about the fact that he was baptized. And that's where his identity came from, that he was now a new creation, a Christian. 
that's why this story that kind of flips by every year so quickly is so important to us. It, God has given us our identity. No one can take it away. No one can steal it. And no one can override it and confer upon us another identity. This is my child with whom I am well pleased. You know, Martin Luther, and I want us to do this, Martin Luther suggested in one of his writings that we make the sign of the cross every night before we retire for bed. And the reason is, is that we have spent the day in struggling, struggling to keep our identity, struggling to know that we are loved by God's grace alone, struggling that we are justified by God uh, and only God, struggling to know, to put it in today's terms, that our worth and value come from God alone and not from the world. Um, and so Luther said, you know, we have to look at the world every night and say, you know what, nevertheless, I am baptized and cross ourselves. And then he said, we need to cross ourselves every single morning because in God's love and grace, God holds on to our identity and says to us, this is my child with whom I am well pleased. And we thank God making the sign of the cross of our new identity that God has given us a brand new day um, to go out there and, and live the struggle again. It is by his grace that we celebrate this baptism on Sunday, baptism of Jesus. Um, and so what I would like us to do at this time is to remember our baptisms and to make the sign of the cross. You know, it wasn't done so that we could do it before we get up to bat or, you know, before things go bad. It was done to remind us of the power of God's gift of baptism and the power of God's grace saying to us, I am God's child. <clears throat> I, um, I put up one time, put a, um, poster in my office. I also have given it to my grandchildren in little frames with a mirror. And it says, I know I'm okay because God doesn't make junk. So in remembrance to our baptisms, that we are indeed children of God, that we are the sons and daughters of God with whom God is well pleased, that we are the brothers and sisters of Jesus Christ, a new creation. Let us now say, nevertheless, we are baptized children of God and make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. With all Christians around the world, let us confess our baptismal faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, God eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him, all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Holy Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, 
and all people in need. For the church throughout the world and its leaders, that guided by the Holy Spirit, they may proclaim the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the nations of the world and their leaders, for laborers busy both day and night, and for peacemakers amid strife, that God inspire all people to use their strength wisely. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. For the sick and those who provide medical care, for the imprisoned and those who show them mercy, for the lonely and those who provide companionship, for all who suffer, especially Herb and Teresa Shepherding, Mary Kramer, the family of Marcy Moore, the family and friends of Carl Johnson, William Fino, Anthony Fino, Eric Johnson, Lou Sagstad, Charles and Audrey Klein, John Toth, Michael Perrone and Sons, Jay Croft, Linda Fino, Rick Spaulding, Barbara Christ, Don Miller, Barbara Ann Shepard, Steve Wren, the family of Clifford Whitmoyer, Christina, James Glass, Emmy Boldenberg, Marcia Engler, Karen Broxma, Ken Pheasant, Sharon Masukiak, Ed, and all others whom we name now aloud or in our hearts. Emily and her mother, Martha. The family of Sandra Anderson. For our fractured and divided nation and for courage of many of our leaders of uh, this past week for guidance for those who who strove to leaders and citizens who strove to divide and overtake the government of this country that we may be healed again and become once again the bastion of freedom in the world have mercy on us oh god Amen. For the congregation gathered here, for students returning to school, for those seeking renewal in their daily work, that all the beloved of God experience grace and peace, let us pray. Have mercy, Have mercy on God. God. In thanksgiving for the faithful departed who now rest from their labors, that their witness inspire us in our baptismal vocations. Let us pray. Have mercy, O God. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Siblings in Christ, as we pause to listen to the offertory, we are encouraged to consider our invitation to be stewards of the resources given to us by God. Offerings are an act of worship. Um, stewardship is what we do after we say, I believe. Prayerfully consider how God invites us to offer what God has given to us. Offerings that are discerned to be offered to the Lord through the Church of St. Matthias may be mailed to the church office. Offerings discerned to be offered to the Lord through the Church of St. Paul's may be mailed to the church office or given online at the St. Paul's website. Let us prayerfully consider now our offerings. and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything 
to God in prayer. and temptations is there trouble anywhere be discouraged take it to the Lord in prayer and we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. and heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge, take it to the Lord in prayer. Do your friends despise for He'll take and shield you. You will find a solace there. Oh, well. Your will be done on earth, O oh Lord. Your will be done on earth, O oh Lord. Your will be done on earth, O oh Lord. Your will be done on earth, O oh Praise and thanks to you, holy God, for by your word, you made all things. You spoke light into darkness. You called forth beauty from chaos. You brought life into being. For your word of life, O oh God. We give you thanks and praise. By your word, you called your people Israel to tell of your wonderful gifts, freedom from captivity, water on the desert journey, a pathway home from exile, wisdom for life with you, for your word of life, O Lord. We give you thanks and praise. Through Jesus, your word made flesh, you speak to us and call us to witness, forgiveness through the cross, life to those entombed by death, the way of your self-giving love, for your word of life, O God. We give you thanks and praise. Send your spirit of truth, O God, rekindle your gifts within us, renew our faith, increase our hope, deepen our love for the sake of a world in need. Faithful to your word, O God, draw near to all who call on you through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory forever. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us. 
Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let on your hearts and receive the Lord's blessing. May Almighty God, who sent the Holy Spirit to Mary, proclaim joy through the angels, sent the shepherds with good news, and led the Magi by a star bless you this day through the word made flesh. You're now invited to, look, to sing along while muted at home. Go in peace, share the gift of Jesus.
Thanks, Peter. 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 Thanks, Peter.